compared to our country, uh, the stuff I do now is more architecture and design than it is than it is art. It didn't start that way. It started as writing. Writings shifted to an art context where work concentrated, where I made work that concentrated on me. Gradually, the stuff became less interested in me, more interested in you, the viewer. As it became more interested in you, the viewer, I needed a space, some place for viewers to be. And viewer was something I, I never liked the word viewer. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted people who who were at a peace of mind to be users more than viewers, which is probably why the stuff became architecture and design. In other words, I started to realize I was much more interested in a spoon, a glass, than I was in art. I was much more interested in things that people used as part of their everyday life, part of their everyday living. So I hope maybe we can talk about some of that. I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about growing up in the Bronx, your neighborhood, what it was like when you were there yeah. as opposed yeah. to what it's like now. Where did you grow up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of right opposite, right opposite Fordham, Fordham, Univer Fordham University. I grew up on uh, Bathgate Avenue and Fordham, and Fordham, Fordham Oh, Road. God, that's right, it looks to me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was kind of, at that time, it was kind of in between uh, uh, basically an Irish neighborhood and, and, an, Itali and, a, and uh, an, Ita an Italian neighborhood. Uh, Jewish neighborhood was maybe five, five, ten minute walk away, Grand, Con Concourse. Grand Concourse. Yeah. Did you know you were an artist then? Probably, yeah. I mean, some yeah. some kind of, you know, I didn't know what, exactly what that meant, but it would have something to do, I mean, I mean, my father was probably the biggest influence on me. My father was a bathrobe, bathrobe maker in the Bronx, a few blocks away from Bathgate Avenue, Arthur, Arthur Avenue. He had a bathrobe, bathrobe factory, a very money losing bathrobe factory. Uh, influenced me, influenced me that way also. Uh, uh, but was like totally involved in uh, in art, music, literature. But in a way that was very much a part of his everyday life. It wasn't, you know, sure. He and I went to you know, went to the Metropolitan Museum every Sunday. Uh, I, I went to the Metropolitan Opera. I, I had seen La Boheme probably eight times by the time I was five, year, five years old. But my father, I mean, my father uh, was born, born, in, born in Italy, came to the United States when he was like 11 and became tremendously obsessed with the American language. So he would always speak to me in puns and playing with words. It totally shaped the way I the way I thought. You know, and my father was constantly punning. Like uh, the Lord said to Saint Peter, "Come forth," but Peter came fifth, so we lost the race. Or uh, uh, what's honey? What's honeymoon salad? Let us alone. Don't look now. Mayonnaise is dressing. <laughs> so that was just so much a part of the way I thought. You know? uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he would play. He would play Verdi to me, Verdi for me uh, on record. But he would also play, you know, Cole Porter, Cole Porter, Cole Porter music. So I grew up thinking that, in some ways, I had like the most privileged way of growing up because it was, I almost had no choice. Of course, I was going to do something, something like art because this was so much. This was so much a part of. of it was like a, a way of a way of living. It wasn't. It wasn't about learning learning something. Uh, uh, my father would open a bottle of wine and we would walk to the window and he would put the wine glass up to the window so the sun could come in and hit it and he would call this the candling of the wine. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, but, 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 every, but in everything, you know, I, I always like every part of life got, got kind of uh, thinking to it, some kind of play with it. You know? and so I always thought of art as play. Art is like, uh, you know, you take something that exists and you say, well, what happens if I turn it upside down? What happens if I scratch it? What happens if I turn it inside out? I still think that's what art, that's what art is, you know? You can answer it and if you want or if you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to, but what was your inspiration? What was my in inspiration? I had to be different ones throughout the, throughout the years. Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, 
probably you know, probably like the first big influence I had you know, a long time ago when I was uh, maybe 15, 16, <laughs> was uh, was uh, Faulkner, William Fa William Faulkner's writing. Why? What interested me in Faulkner was that it's he made it seem so impossible to make a sentence end, so impossible to 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 have a period because a period ended something. So he wanted something to always be in motion, in process. And I think that's something that's you know probably affected the way I've worked ever 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 since. But through the years, there've been like so many so many influences. Probably not so much not so much for not so much from art, more from architecture, from from movies and from music. Probably, I mean, I would say probably the biggest influence, the biggest influence I've made through the years has been has been music, has been the particular music of the time. Like at the end of the '60s, the beginning of the '70s, you know, I was listening to uh, the pop music everybody was listening to at the time: uh, Van Morrison, Neil Young single voice, long song, which was very much like the kind of work I was doing. Uh, single single person circling around myself, trying to examine myself, needing time to do it. By the mid-70s, stuff of mine wasn't live performance anymore. Stuff became stuff began stuff became installations with audio with audio tape. The way I thought of installations was uh, uh, people are going to come to a gallery or museum anyway. Now that they're here, could a piece be used to start a community, form a community? Mm -hmm. So usually there would be some kind of almost like a, a, a space with tables, seats, places where people could could uh, gather together. There would be my voice on audio tape, almost calling a, a meeting together. At that time, my music, the music influences changed. It was the mid seventies. I was listening to stuff like the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, no longer single voice, now uh, mass voice, short song, because uh, because the music was trying to be a kind of scream. A scream can't last too long. A scream lasts a minute and a half. It doesn't last seven minutes like uh, like earlier stuff. The more the stuff became became like design and architecture. I mean, we always have music on music on in the studio. The music we tend to listen to now is a kind of pop, pop electronic music. Vladislav Delay, Plastic Man, Aphex Twin. Uh, I think music is probably the biggest influence for us because I think music and architecture are are really are really the same. Both music and architecture make a surrounding, make a context. Both in music and architecture. Uh, you can do something else while you can do something else while you're listening to music. You can do something else when you're, you know, in ar in architecture. So then, so music sets up a kind of surrounding, a kind of context. Again, I can name millions of influences. You know, <laughs> been, you know, I can say, you know, I, there are probably a hundred movies. I've said that this is the most important movie in the world to me. You know, <laughs> and it ranges from a lot of Godard movies in the '60s. Uh, Contempt, uh, 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 some earlier movies, some some American movies, John Ford movies, The Searchers, uh, later David Cronenberg movies, Videodrome. Uh, I mean, movies were always movies were always in the back of my mind. Though I have a real love hate relationship with movies. I love the idea of a movie. I hate the idea of well now now obviously you don't you don't have to do this anymore. But I hate the idea of sitting in the dark and watching something. It's too much like too much like dreaming. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wish a movie could be shown on a city on a city street, you know, mm -hmm. that it could be shown on but on buildings so that as you walk, you go from scene to scene of a movie, you know, so that. Uh, and I, but but again, saying that reveals that I like things that you can do other things in the meantime. With your poetry, you know, it seems like you focus on structure and like yeah. and the one that's like. Read this word, now read this word, yeah. read this word yeah. first. Yeah. You know, remind me of, you know, Gertrude Stein, I don't know if she yeah. Yeah. Point yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, the biggest, biggest, mm -hmm. was the biggest influence, obviously, the choice was an influence, Gertrude Stein was an, was an, was an influence. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of French poetry, Mallarmé, uh, uh, who seems to be trying to, almost trying to, trying to use words to get to a blank space. 
uh, obviously you're starting with the blank page, but if you use words and try to get to blankness, and that's kind of what I what I think I was trying I was trying to do. I was trying to I was trying to make words probably do something they can't do and maybe shouldn't do. I wanted them to be kind of mature. With your poetry, were you more well known for your poetry than your um, performance or video art? No, I don't think hardly anybody knew. Uh, I mean, stuff of mine was was public was was published was published in a lot of little magazines that came out then. There was some some anthologies, but I don't think the stuff I don't think the stuff was known was known that was known that much. Um, I, I mean, when I started doing stuff in an, in an art context. Some people in an art context knew of me as a writer, but I don't, think, I don't think anybody else did. And in some ways, that was a kind of deterrent. To people thought, "Oh, he's really, he's really a writer." Just as more recently, when I, when stuff has become architecture and design, a lot of, a lot of architects I know, strangely, architects, architects about 20 years younger than me, have no problem accepting us as architects, architects of my, of my generation. So it was a while. He's really, he's really an art, really an artist. Have you ever done a piece that would offend people? That would offend. <laughs> yeah, that would. Offend. Apparently, I have. Uh, yeah. Uh, what did Seedbed offend people? I don't know if it offended people. I think they, I think they saw the. I, I don't know. I always thought, how can it? I, I, you know, I'm not, sometimes I have a kind of, you know mixture of incurable optimism and blindness because uh, maybe I don't want to I don't want to anticipate what a reaction is going to be because that would kind of stop me you know uh, I mean for me when I was doing seedbed I thought you know, it seemed like it was a time it was a time of that so I, I, I you know again I might have this gift of, of making myself blind blind to something but it didn't occur to me that would be so shocking. It became more of a joke <laughs> than shocking, and a kind of interesting joke. I mean, I, I, I remember one one great joke that it's very easy. It's very easy to own to own a video country piece. All you have to do is shake his hand, <laughs> which isn't bad, <laughs> which is pretty good. Uh, uh, what other stuff are you into besides attitude? You mean in doing ourselves, or like I sketching, or I draw really badly. <laughs> I've never, never drawn well. No, I mean no. That that's a kind of. I think that's a significant part of whatever career I've had. Yeah. It's really been based on not knowing how to do how to do anything. You know, maybe knowing how to write. Uh, uh, but. It's kind of significant that stuff of mine entered an, entered an art context in 1968, 1969. It was a time when the words conceptual art were first being used. At another time, there would have been absolutely no place for me. You know, I couldn't paint, I couldn't draw, I couldn't sculpt. So there was absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing for me to do. Once the words conceptual art were used, I could say, well, I think I know how to have vague ideas. <laughs> so there's some kind of place for me here. But that kind of place is really important, I think, for not just for me, but anybody. You know, there are certain times that it becomes possible for something, for somebody to enter something. At other times, it probably isn't. You know, or you have to make your own way. Yeah. It was starting to become architecture in the beginning of the 80s, but but seriously started to become it at the end of, at, in like 1988. Very, 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 very specifically, like in 1988, once I realized the stuff belonged in public space more than it, more than it belonged in a museum or gallery, once I realized that I wanted the stuff to function as architecture in the sense that I wanted it to be a place that people could be in, that people could use, I started to work differently. I realized I couldn't work as a single person anymore. Uh, and one of the basic reasons I couldn't work as a single person, I started to think, if I begin something privately, maybe it'll always end private. I started to become very affected. And in a lot of ways, what I'm saying probably proves that I started as a writer, and maybe, I, maybe I'll, always be, I'll always be a writer, because I got very affected by English language phrases like, the person who lives by the sword dies by the sword which made me think, I start something private, it ends private. 
if I want something to be public, it has to be it has to begin at least semi public. And I think for me, and I, I think for a lot of other people, public probably begins with the number three. You know, one is a solo, two is a couple or a mirror image. The third person starts an argument. The third person thickens the thickens thickens, thickens, thickens the plot. And I think I think you know, public is about an argument. It's about it's about this it's about disagreement. I mean, nobody knows who composes the public. It's a composite of millions of privates from different histories, different backgrounds, different biases. So if you can deal with public, it seems like it's about a collision. It's not about a blending. You know, when people say the people, it seems like these people all believe in the same thing. They don't. It's about a swarm. It's about multitudes. So, so you don't want to like have anything private anymore? Yeah. Um, you want its architecture because you think that's like what people would use, or? Well, I mean, what interested me about architecture was that, is that architecture. Uh, you can almost say that architecture is the art of uh, everyday life, because everybody knows architecture, even if they don't realize it, because everybody's walked up a stairway, everybody's gone through a doorway, everybody's in the middle of architecture, no matter what else what else they're doing. So you inherently use it. I mean, what always bothered me about art, and I think the reason I started doing art at the end of the 60s, one of the reasons I started doing art, was out of a resentment against the do not touch signs in a museum. Because in every other in every other field of life, when you come upon something for the first time, you pick it up, you turn it upside down, you touch it, you smell it, maybe you taste it. But in art, the tradition is the viewer stands here and the art is there. So the viewer is always in a position of desire, but always frustrated desire. You know, you want something, but you can't, you can't, you can't have. It. And also, what occurred to me is that. Of course, people can't touch the art because the art is more expensive than people art, which seems like a pretty repulsive situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, would you take that as inspiration? Like saying to do not touch you know, signs? Yeah, no, no, yeah, that, that's true. When you asked about inspirations before, I named, you know, I, 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 I named particular, you know, particular people, particular musicians, but, but I think, you know, one real inspiration was something like, uh, you know, uh, here's a sign that says, you know, do not, do not touch, but it's right there, it's right within my reach. Why can't I touch it? You know, another inspiration for me was New, was New York. The fact that I was born in born in New York, I realized uh, I realized uh, sometime in the '70s when I went to Chicago for the first time, I realized that wow, you can see buildings in Chicago. Like Chicago was built with vistas, with panoramas. Whereas in Manhattan, in order to see a building, you have to like come to come to Brooklyn. And Manhattan isn't built as a visual city, but it's built very much as a tangible city. You feel things around you. New York is a close-up space, and I think that notion of close-up space is really, really important. You know, if something's close up, you know, you can you can you can touch it. You can automatically handle it. You don't just see it. I think my stuff has always been so much about the tangible, the touchable, more than more than the, more than the visual. Can I have a video of Conti, please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to... I'll come back in a few minutes. <laughs>